but it's really my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Larry Keith. Uh, we met him when we went to um, uh, Kenya with our family this past summer, um, and we're just so impressed by him and, um, and thought that it would be just a tremendous experience um, for y'all to get to meet him. And so uh, um, here he has to say, he. Um, is a native of Michigan, um, grew up in Grand Haven, Michigan, uh, went to a small little liberal arts college, uh, Calvin College um, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and then uh, went to the big uh, University of Michigan for med school, um, did his OBGYN residency there, um, was then uh, drafted into the Army, and uh, was stationed at Fort Rucker, Alabama. Um, and so I think that's probably a little bit of a culture shock. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> And um, I didn't say a bad culture shock, <laughs> talking what the South was like. And um, so then uh, after his um, time serving our country, he moved to Fort Collins, Colorado, and um, continues to live there um, for today. He um, uh, was in private practice in um, obstetrics and gynecology there, uh, was uh, involved in resident education with uh, family medicine residents, uh, was also uh, an advocate for women uh, there, uh, was uh, the uh, was chosen by the uh, Larimer County uh, Medical Society as their outstanding physician of the year numerous times while he was there. Um, and then practiced for a little over 33 years in private practice, uh, retired in 2012, and then kind of started the next chapter of his life. So he, uh, went and got a master's in public health uh, from uh, Colorado School of Public Health, and um, then now um, travels internationally, um, practicing OGYN, teaching residents, students, um, healthcare professionals, um, has mostly been in Africa, has worked in six um, nations in Africa, and then now is uh, at Tinwick Hospital in uh, Bonnet, uh, Kenya, and goes there, um, he's there about four months out of the year, does a month at a time, so he's there a month, one month every, of every three months. And um, just uh, has a great story and um, is uh, definitely um, has uh, lots of knowledge about um, women's health in the developing country. And so we're excited about um, having him speak. So, Dr. Larry Keith. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, it sounds like I'm just, they couldn't figure out what they were supposed to be when they grew up, and that probably is the case. So I'm trying to encourage you um, not to close doors, and if you think that you've made your final decision by going into either pediatrics or OBGYN, and now the rest of your life is pretty well settled, I have a surprise for you. That's probably not true. There'll be a lot of opportunities along the way. Um, I was the oldest one in my graduate school class, however, but um, they taught me how to do PowerPoints and how to take courses online. So I found that, that even in my advanced age, I was able to still do some of that. I'm going to talk to you um, about global health, um, and particularly women's global health. And I'm going to give you an overview, both statistically and then some of the uh, stories or things that have brought this home to me. Um, I tend to talk rapidly when I'm a little anxious, and I'll settle down partway through the talk. Um, but I'm going to start out um, with just a couple of things um, about why women's health should matter, matter and um, a little bit about then what some of the issues that are faced for that. Um, learning objectives, you're getting a CEME, so you need to, um, I'm checking my hip when I heard that pager go off. I haven't worn a pager for a while. Um, and really what we're going to talk about is um, what is unique about women's health. Both men and women uh, face health issues. Please get food. Don't be nervous. Get food on your way in. Um, and um, what's unique about that and why we could justify talking um, separately about women's health in the developing world. A little bit about determinants of women's health, both biological and social. And uh, hoping that you'll be able to identify the difference between the two and how both of them impact um, health issues for women. And then look at some data because, you know, we're data driven. What are, how we can compare women's health in different parts of the world, what impacts we can make on that. So that's um, 
uh, what we're aiming at. There will not be a test afterwards, so relax. Um, you don't have to take notes, and we'll just talk a little bit as we go through here. So I'm going to tell you about three uh, different situations that I've faced. This is Blessing. This is in Nigeria. Um, I spent time in Nigeria. Um, Blessing um, was the only child of a second wife um, in a, a polygamous marriage. Uh, her mother was very attractive, as is Blessing. You can see that smile. And um, the husband seemed to favor the second wife. This did not go over well with the senior wife, um, who also had borne children uh, to this man. And uh, she made life miserable for Blessing's mother. Eventually, Blessing's mother fled the household and left Blessing. She was then the object of some of this uh, displeasure of the senior wife because she looked like her mother. And so she had more tasks to do. When she was 14 years old, one day the uh, stepmother said, I want you to take a shower and dress nice. And she was getting ready for school, but she was locked in the pantry. A few hours later, a man came and picked her up and she was given to this man. At 14, she was um, brought to the man's place where he was living, um, was essentially raped, and uh, was locked up in the house. At 15, she gave birth to her first child. Um, the man was pleased because she had given birth to a son, and so became kinder. At 19, she gave birth to her second son. When she was about 20, um, the man became ill, seemed to lose a lot of weight, and mysteriously died. Um, he was HIV positive. Um, she was living in the same compound as her in-laws. Her in-laws in blamed her for her, their, their son getting HIV and drove her out of the com compound and kept the two boys. She went to a major city called Joss um, and was there destitute found a place called Faith Alive, which was a sort of a free clinic that was run by a Nigerian physician. She was tested and she was HIV positive. Um, there they provided housing for her and training as a seamstress and she became self-sufficient and she then eventually started teaching at the sewing school at this place. She went back and when her in-laws were gone shopping, she kidnapped her boys and brought them um, to the capital city, and her boys now live there. She's reestablished relationship with the boys' grandparents, and they do visit her. These are babies that I met in Mali. Um, the three pack that you see here, um, that was the, the, their isolate in the little hospital there. Um, they were triplets that were born in a village and the mother died and they were brought to the hospital. And so the inquiry was, well, how did she die? Did she bleed? She died. Um, did she live for a while after the babies were born? She died. So there was very little information. She, her birth was, the births were attended by some um, traditional birth attendant that may have been someone with some limited uh, information. But their father was, a farmer. He was the second son of a second wife, and he could find no one to help raise the babies. This baby, um, the mother came into the hospital, it was called Cuchiella Women and Children's Hospital, um, and the mother was unconscious and had had the history of having some seizures or something in the village and brought to the hospital. She had extremely high blood pressure. Um, she was started on magnesium sulfate. We sent the nurse midwife on their motorbike into the village to see if we could find some hydralazine and uh, did find that at a low, uh, local chemistry and treated her blood pressure. She didn't regain consciousness. We, the question was, did she have health syndrome? We had no lab to uh, really assess liver enzymes. In a CBC, the doctor said to me, what difference is it going to make because we don't have a blood bank or have anything anyways? So I congratulated myself, did a forceps delivery, went home, figured I'd come back and there'd be resolving blood pressure. I came back in the morning, the mother had died. This, the 
father of this child was the oldest son of the first wife. And so the baby went home. Now what I didn't tell you is wrapped in here were three little girls. Um, this proud little person um, is a boy. This is rural Nigeria. Um, and what we have here is um, a little local Catholic church that became the primary school. There'd never been a school in this village. An organization was helping start a school. So they took small children and they could come to school. Unfortunately, this little girl was standing outside trying to learn by listening through the window. She was considered too old to come to school and it was designed for small children. This is another school in Nigeria, and you see school uniforms, which cost money. <coughs> so here's some things about women's health that were raised by these three stories. Blessing, marriage and adolescence, 14, 15. Forced, first episode of intercourse, first child in her mid-teens, husband infected by HIV, and she became infected by that blame and stigma attached to her by uh, causing the husband's death from HIV AIDS and driven from her home without her children. The baby stories, maternal mortality, a reality. This was a small little hospital in a catchment area and within a matter of about four days we had two maternal deaths. It happened one in the village, one after trying to deliver the village. Social status of the mother influenced the fate of, of the babies, where, where you were as far as in the construction of that family. Gender bias determined the fate of the infants. One good piece of news, those three little girls were adopted by a Malayan family, and uh, they also in, allowed the father of the babies to come visit and be part of their lives as well. So there is a happy ending to that part of the story. Watching from the outside, access to education is often gender determined, so girls have less access than boys. And poverty is a comorbidity in access to education and health care. So why should we address women's issues and health issues as a separate thing? So a great quote that being born female, particularly in the developing world, is dangerous to your health. Um, Women are subject to discrimination and prescribed roles which affect their health. We'll talk a little bit about that. Women have unique health problems by virtue of sex and also their place in society. We'll talk about the difference about biology and gender. There are important and unjustifiable differences in health care uh, related to gender. Premature uh, death, morbidity, and disability of women have an enormous social and economic consequence. We tend to not think about that because of um, oftentimes these women do not work outside the home, but most of the uh, women in the developing world are, are doing agriculture and supporting the family through that or little arts and crafts. And an investment in women's health can decrease the number of deaths, but also decreases the number of disability <laughs> adjusted life years. That's something I learned in graduate school. I have to just tell you that so you think I'm really smart because I learned that in public health. But it really is talking about productivity that's lost by uh, premature death or also by um, the morbidity. This is what Margaret Chin has to say. The obstacles that stand in the way of better um, health for women are not primarily technical or medical in nature but rather social and political. And we have to deal with that reality in the world in which we live. It's also true in our society, but probably to a lesser degree than it is in the developing world. So here's some of the determinants of women's health. So biological determinants are based on sex, XX, right? So here's some of the things that are uh, really um, determinants for women that are unique. Anemia related to menstruation, we don't think about that in the United States, but that's a huge thing in the developing world about iron sources, uh, adequate diet and nutrition, and so a chronic anemia is always there. Pregnancy related risk, uh, PIH pregnancy induced hypertension, hemorrhage with delivery, eclampsia, infection around delivery, fistula formation, 
uh, abortion. Increased risk of sexually transmitted infections. We'll talk a little bit about why that is the true, but HIV deficiency, or uh, HIV, HPV, uh, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, or more likely be contracted by women based on their anatomy. And then cancers that are unique, like cervical, uterine, ovarian, vulvar, and of course the disproportionate share of breast cancer as well. Here's some social determinants of health. Gender is cultural. And we talk about, you know, uh, I make a joke in my specialty about now I offer gender diversity. When I was in training, it was mostly males, and we had one or two females that offered gender diversity. That wasn't really true. Um, we had a lot of the same social things, but I now recognize that I did offer gender diversity by being a white male in a, a, in a country where that is well uh, uh, linked to a lot of advantages. So social determinants relate predominantly to social norms. We'll talk about what that impact is. Gender has uh, preferences and the antenatal consequences. Feeding inequalities are related to gender. Physical and sexual abuse, economic inequalities. And then we talked already about poverty, uh, low educational levels as having the same effect. So here's some burdens of health that we're gonna go through real quickly. Gender bias and sex selection, female genital cutting, sexually transmitted infections, violence and sexual abuse, maternal morbidity and mortality, unsafe abortions, obstetrical fistulas. So just, this is not a complete list of the challenges for being a woman in the developing world. This is just some things that we're gonna to highlight today. So gender bias and sex selection, you're all aware of that uh, China for a long time had a policy of one child per family. And the, de the desire was to have a male child. Um, India has also had a, a preference for male uh, uh, infants, and it's not unheard of in many other cultures. But in particularly those two large cultures, there was a now a way to find out about the gender of the baby before it was born, most often by ultrasound. And then there was more likelihood to terminate female fetuses. Now this has led to some skewed uh, male to female ratios. The normal ratio is 105 girls to 100 boys. But in China, the ratio is now 120 males to 100, fe 100 females. Um, there's some real consequences to this. One, 20 out of 120 males are not too happy uh, <laughs> because uh, there aren't enough uh, women to be available for marriage. Um, that is a real difficulty. It has led to um, violence against women through rape, increased prostitution from this uh, standpoint, um, a lot of um, addictive behavior as far as alcohol and drugs in the male population that are unmarried there. And so that's had a consequence for um, their, their culture. Um, there's also preferential feeding practices for males over females. So if you look at, it, particularly in the developing world, first at the trough is, is the father, then the male children, then might be the female children, and then the mother eats last. And so when you look at malnutrition within a family, you'll find a difference between the girls and the boys just by feeding practices. And there's also a preferential education and health access for males. So the cost associated with schooling, even though schooling in most countries is free, um, is a barrier because you need to have school equipment, there's school fees, and you need to have uniforms. And that sounds like uniforms would be very simple to obtain, but if you're making a dollar a day, and that is your income, Five dollars for a uniform for five kids would be a whole month's income. So that is a, a barrier as well. So when they make the choice, it's usually the oldest son or one of the sons that is sent. And maybe not the oldest because they work on the farm and then there's a, someone else anointed to go to school. Female genital cutting. Um, is terminology important? So what's the most common genital cutting worldwide? Pardon? 
male circumcision. We don't call it male genital mutilation, generally. Um, some people have, but we don't use that term. But when we talk about female genital cutting, we hear about female genital mutilation. Almost no parent <coughs> chooses to have their child mutilated. So we have to figure about how we talk about this, what is the role in society of this. So female genital cutting varies from just the preface around the clitoris being removed, which would be like the foreskin on the penis, all right? Um, but it goes all the way to radical with the removal of almost all the external genitalia and even stitching of the vaginal opening. So there's a whole gradation one to four of this. This is an issue um, in, in the area and something we have to be aware of. The problem is when we don't understand what the role is, is a rite of passage or religious um, encounters or beliefs, we miss the point. In some countries, a girl is not marriageable if she is, does not have female circumcision or female genital cutting done. It's a strong um, uh, custom. It's a social norm. It can be related to a rite of passage. Um, most of the males here will be relieved to know that uh, circumcision in the United States is done on newborns, but in much of the developing world, it's done on 13 or 14 year old boys and it's part of their induction into being adulthood. And they go through a time of training about the culture and their responsibilities of their, their people, what it means to be a male. Um, and circumcision is, happens at that time. When I was in Mali, I saw all these boys running around in yellow little tunics. And I said, well, is that a school uniform? Naively. They go, uh, no, those boys have gone through circumcision so everybody knows to be kind to them while they're healing. Um, and so that was one of the signs of knowing that. Well, the same thing took place for girls in the culture. They were, they were taught by elder women about their role, what that would be. Um, and then it was oftentimes involved in female genital cutting. Um, but it usually happens much earlier for girls between anywhere from the age of four to puberty. Rite of passage would be puberty stuff. Um, more cultural norms for marriageability would be the earlier ones. The other problem is it's done by un, really poorly trained or, or untrained personnel. And it, um, they have no medical training. They really aren't aware of what the anatomy is. They kind of know what it should look like afterwards. Um, so there's some immediate problems with bleeding, pain, and infection. And then there's long-term problems about urinary problems with both incontinence and difficulty urinating, obstructed pro and prolonged labor, uh, pain with intercourse. Um, I'm in a community where we have a lot of international students coming to Colorado State University, so I've, been taking, I've taken care of women that have had this in, in varying types. So it's important to know a little bit about healthcare issues, what can be involved with that. Um, Sexually transmitted infections. Remember your embryology, your uh, growth and development, how as young girls enter puberty, they have uh, glandular cells covering the face of the cervix. And eventually through the uh, hormonal uh, stimulus, metaplasia occurs, squamous cells cover the face of the cervix. and um, that is important in both their sexual maturity, but also protection of that area. Mucosal tissue is more easily traumatized by, um, by intercourse. It's also more easily infected with many of the bacteria and viruses. And so with early onset of intercourse, there's a higher incidence of sexually transmitted infections for girls at that age. Um, and so the age of intercourse is important to think about that. Sexual trauma from intercourse, both consensual and forced, um, it leads to increased effect infectivity. Um, most infections for young girls are ignored, and so um, they, they present for care later with greater severity. Long-term consequences, you know. Big consequences, HIV and HPV 
one being um, leading, the possibility of leading to AIDS and the death associated with that, the other with leading to cervical cancer and death associated with that. So fourfold increase in, in um, disability adjusted life years for women over men, again because of that susceptibility in young women are at increased risk. Violence and sexual abuse, um, 10 to 50 percent of women in, in the developing world, depending on what study you're looking at, have been abused physically by an intimate partner. 20 to 50 percent of adolescent girls report first sexual intercourse was forced. And unfortunately, um, rape is used as a tool of war, resulting in sexually transmitted infections, unwanted pregnancy, injury, which can lead to fistula, painful intercourse in the future, emotional trauma, stigma, social ostracization. Um, as a man, I do not understand this. And I, and, um, I don't, can't comprehend um, um, the episode of rape associated with, with war and uh, violence, but it's a reality. And we have to face that reality with dealing in the women in the, in the developing world. Maternal mor morbidity and mortality. This is what I'm probably most familiar with, and partly because I think there's things that can address it with. Um, you know what the definition is. You know what the difference between morbidity and mortality, when it occurs. About half a million women die each year from pregnancy-related causes. Um, it's expressed as a ratio of deaths per 100,000 uh, live births. Worldwide, maternal mortality is about 400 women per 100,000 uh, live births. 42% of these deaths occur the first day or the day after childbirth. 13% are related to abortions. 15% are, are associated with HIV, AIDS, 80% of the deaths are from direct causes such as hemorrhage, infection, eclampsia, obstructive labor. 20% though are caused by malaria, anemia, HIV AIDS, cardiovascular disease. The highest rates of maternal mortality are in sub-Saharan Africa. That's sort of where I've sort of focused my time. High, and the rates can be as high as 940 women per 100,000. And the lowest rates are in Western Europe, not in the United States. In Western Europe, about five per 100,000. The risk of dying during childbirth is one in 10,000 in Western Europe versus one, one in 16 in Sub-Saharan Africa. A 250-fold increase of maternal mortality. If that doesn't make your heart stop, you should wake up and listen again. <laughs> Um, factors associated, poor nutrition, we talked about that, and uh, general health status, um, low income, low level of education. If you uh, deliver in a village, you're more likely to die than um, in uh, the city. Ethnicity, um, not so much in Africa, but in South America, if you're an indigenous Indian population, your maternal mortality is much higher than um, the mixed uh, colonial um, populations that are there. Maternal age. Adolescents, and a greater than 35 number of children. Unsafe abortions is about 21% of pregnancies end in the termination. Um, and um, a safe abortion is defined as an abortion performed by a trained healthcare provider with proper equipment, correct technique, and sanitary, not sterile. We, we're not even going there, sanitary um, standards. 40% of the abortions performed worldwide are unsafe. The maternal mortality of a safe abortion is one per 100,000, and the maternal mortality from an unsafe abortion varies from 100 to 600 per 100,000. Fistulas caused by obstructed labor most often, or trauma. It's a defect, a hole, between the vaginal wall and the bladder, or the vaginal wall and the rectum, or both. Um, the consequence of the fistula is leakage of urine or stool or both. Um, it has severe social and economic consequences. Um, and so fistula causes a woman to be ostracized. When you don't even have menstrual pads, you can imagine what it's like to be dealing with leaking of urine or stool continuously. So you're usually driven from the home. The home would be 
a dirt floor, mud walled, thatch roofed home. We're not talking about three bedrooms, two baths in the family room. Um, and so there's no separation of living space from sleeping space. And so women are um, usually separated from the house. A lot of the risk factors, complicated pregnancy by poor nutrition, young age at first birth. The pelvis is still developing until about 18 to 20 years of age. When you give birth at 14 or 15, the baby doesn't know the, the bony pelvis is too small to fit through. And so the development occurs, but when it comes time for labor, labor is obstructed. Most births are done by traditional birth attendants um, in a home setting, um, and so the birth attendant isn't particularly trained. Access to hospitals could be a couple days walk. It could be trying to walk to a main road and getting on the back, back of a motorcycle. And then access to the hospital, there's no such thing as Intala. There's not a thing that you're required to see somebody that presents in labor with obstructive labor, or in, at the hospital with obstructive labor. So if you have no money, you could die outside the hospital. Um, young age at first birth, we talked about multiple pregnancies and birth, lack of obstetrical care, um, and genital trauma related to rape or sexual violence. Difference in health between men and women. Women live longer than men. In the developing world, only a year longer. But in the high income countries, seven years longer. That means women suffer more disability adjusted life years than men and causing them overall to be less healthy. So if you look, 70% more disability from Alzheimer's, 60% more from osteoarthritis and vision, 40% more from cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events, 50% more due to depression. We already talked about cost and consequences. One of the big things is we forget about that when the mother dies in the developing world, the child is an orphan. Um, because most of the males are going to be laborers, untrained, and they are in no way equipped to take care of children. They're in the field all the time. They can't help. Children have uh, uh, greater nutrition need, uh, losses when the mother isn't around. If you look at statistically, there's increased um, deaths before age 10 in, in children whose mothers have died. Um, we talked about the stigma and the economic loss. Millennium Development Goals, before we scoff, you have to understand that this is a big deal, that in, uh, a goal was sent, set in 15 years in eight different, or eight different categories to decrease some of the uh, inequalities and inequities in, health, in both health care and in development. So um, they were adopted by the United Nations in the year 2000, made a co commitment to combat poverty, hunger, disease, education for all kids, uh, equal opportunities, protect the environment, establish global partnership. Each of these then had numeric goals, which was something completely new. You know, the usual thing, you write a grant to get money to decrease something. And then you try to get the data to show that you'd really decrease something. They put numeric goals on there. And Millennium Development 5, uh, improved maternal health, that was to decrease maternal mortality by 75% in each country. But if you look at all of the first six goals, they all have an impact on women's health and are affected by the health of women too, whether it's the health of children or access to medication for HIV. Um, this is a chart that looked at what the chances of reaching the goals are. The most important thing is to look down here. Target was a met or expected to be met or progress insufficient. And then I'm gonna take you back here. So what we see here now is Sub-Saharan Africa. And you will get a sense that they're gonna meet none of the goals except equal enrollment in primary school, maybe. So when we're talking about disparities in different areas of the world, you'll find some that have um, that had great progress. So we're looking at Eastern Asia. That looks pretty good. Um, the difference between North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, quite a bit of difference with that as well. So what we see is although these um, goals are not going to be met, 
you have to understand that if you drop from 940 women per 100,000 di uh, live births dying and you get down to 500, you didn't meet the goal. You didn't reduce it by 75%. But 490 more women are living for every 100,000. So although we can't celebrate victory in here, there's been progress made in both most countries. Um, not all of them. There's been some comments made about that. Um, what we find is that um, still there are certain areas where it's going to be most helpful if we can get some equity for girls, education for girls. Um, and it points out that when you look at all six of those first goals, it's hard to meet them. Here's the quick fact that I do the shocker for friends or people from my church or if I'm talking at community groups. Here's maternal mortality because this is what drives me crazy. 360 women become pregnant every minute. 190 women face an unplanned or unwanted pregnancy. High percentage, but it's true. 110 women experience a pregnancy-related complication. 40 women have an abortion. And one woman dies as a result of pregnancy every minute. Every day, a thousand girls and women die in pregnancy-related or childbirth um, problems. Each year, if contraception was available, we'd have 188 million unintended pregnancies prevented, which would be 150,000 fewer women dying. So access to, to contraception is important. Um, if we had skilled health workers um, at present, that would also decrease it. it. Could recognize problems, even if they can't do it. Could recognize and send them someplace. And the statement was: maternal deaths are the greatest health inequity in the 21st century. 99% of maternal deaths occur in the developing world. Um, this is a great study, and you know, uh, this was printed in the Lancet in 2010. But they did stuff. You know, getting statistics, we find it so easy to get statistics. We go down to the registry. We can find out how many deaths, how many births. We can even get quite a bit of data. There's no, there's very few of those that are in the developing world. A lot of times, you have to pay money to register a death or register a birth. Well, the person's dead. Why do you pay money to say the person is dead? Or you have the kids, so why do you have to pay money to show you have the child? So trying to get the data is really difficult. This paper did some interesting things. They went and did um, uh, family um, surveys. So they'd go talk to somebody and tell them everybody in the family that was alive, how many kids they had, and then who died at what age. And so they got some good data from that. They did uh, projections that were based on small uh, surveys that were done in a small area and projected the whole country. But it was really um, a very thorough look at uh, what had occurred in um, 28 years, really around some of the millennial goals. Um, and so th this is probably one of the most accurate looks at what had happened throughout the world. Here's an important thing. It documented a decline in maternal mortality worldwide, but revealed uneven progress. 50% of the maternal deaths are in only six countries. Now, India, you would be not surprised if you're counting numbers. India is a huge country, and so you'd have a number. But Nigeria, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, DRC. In those countries, 50% of the maternal deaths are occurring. Um, in the absence of HIV, Instead of being 530,000 um, women, we could decrease that by 282,000 if we were, had people treated for HIV. Um, only two, 23 countries uh, in the world are on track to achieve the 75% decrease. Gives you maternal mortality. Um, in this case, being more colorful is not good. Okay, so if you look at the map, you can see the countries uh, that ha have highest. This is DRC right here. Here's um, Horn of Africa, which is Somalia. Um, and just gives you an idea of that worldwide. 
a lot of difference in countries. You can't look at a continent and say, you know, well, South America is doing well. You can look at two, um, board, oops, two bordering countries, um, such as uh, Bolivia and Chile. Huge difference in um, what the maternal mortality is, 180 per 100,000 versus uh, 16. Um, Chile has a really great national health program. They spend $967 um, per capita for health care, and Bolivia spends 97. Bolivia has high indigenous Indian population, 52% versus 4.6. So again, talking about the difference in indigenosity, I just made that word up, being indigenous um, in that. Sub-Saharan Africa, I already told you all the bad news there. Um, some countries did decrease their maternal mortality by 50%. Sudan no longer is in that list because of the wars there. Um, bad thing here is Zimbabwe tripled the maternal mortality from 1980 to 2008. So we're not making steady progress. Um, and you, I can tell you the difference between two Bangladesh and Pakistan, the difference in those areas, what they've done as far as contraception, what they've done as far as family size, mortality, education of girls, um, very different, and it shows in the data. This is one of the programs that I was part of in uh, Bangladesh, which was teaching traditional birth attendants. Remember I told you bad, bad um, photography, but um, these are people that are in the village delivering, and the, I, I will say the enemy of better is of, uh, of of better is best. So there's a lot of people that won't interact with traditional birth attendants because we really should have trained midwives. So you're only encouraging things by having traditional birth attendants. Problem is there aren't enough trained <laughs> midwives. That would be nurse midwives. And so this program was to teach these women some safety techniques. They got a little delivery kit. I'm sure that looks different than your delivery table. Um, there's a little pot with a string that you boil uh, so that you can tie off the cord with something that's sort of sterile. You had a razor blade, soap. Soap plays a big part. Washing your hands ahead of time. Some gauze. Um, there was a little uh, betadine to put on the cord. They were using cow dung to dehydrate the, car, the cord. And of course, neonatal tetanus uh, doesn't uh, do well. Um, and so they were getting tetanus from that. <coughs> the women could, couldn't read. So somebody drew on a little mural teaching them about what things they should do as far as nutrition. I saw a little partograph that has sun coming up, sun going down, sun coming up again. And if the, ba if the baby wasn't out by the time the sun came up the second time, you're supposed to send them drawings of an arm hanging out, blood pouring out from the diagram. Uh, it gave you some clue about what they're trying to teach these people ascending them. Um, and they then went home with this little kit. They had a plastic to put under the bottom rather than um, just normal cloth that had been used before or the ground. And so they had shown real change in infection rate and trying to get people to hospitals. Um, next step was antenatal care. And so this is Nigeria. And it was a nice clinic. Um, and you would come for antenatal care. If you get three visits during a pregnancy, you're considered having had antenatal care in the developing world. That would be not three in three weeks, three during the entire pre pregnancy. Um, but this is progress. This would be a delivery table in a clinic that would be um, used by a, a trained midwife. This is Tinwick Hospital, the Dr. Cooper's, Cooper, Cooper, and I were at. Um, it looks great. There's a monitor there. I should tell you that usually there's paper, but not always. I mean, it's just one of those things that's not always there. Um, they are delivery tables, but I should have shown you the close-up that it's rusted off in the bottom and it's sitting on a piece of wood. You don't want to know what's down there, but the tops of the tables are wiped off, at least with some disinfectant, so that's good. Um, so now we're talking about moving from home births to antenatal care, maybe a delivery by a nurse midwife to being in a hospital where 
you can get a trained care. So um, the old white guy is me. Um, this is Sinkat, who was doing his third C-section. And that day we did three, three four, and five, uh, all in one day. He is a general medical school graduate. Um, in one year, you're supposed to learn how to do C-sections, appendix, set bones, treat major illnesses, sew up lacerations. And so my goal was to make him C-section ready and be part of that. He was also very, very bright and has great hands. Some people just have great hands to start out with. But when I was starting operating with him, so I said, so Sinket, how many C-sections, because he was there, how many C-sections have you done? He said, well, this would be my third one. So he went, ooh, OK. Uh, can I just talk to you while you're doing that? But uh, it's a great boon, because they're going to be posted out in very rural areas. This happens to be about a 300-bed mission teaching hospital. But they prepare people to be out in rural areas. So this is one of the things to address. Um, that, that difficulty. This talks about vesicovaginal fistulas um, and gives you all the, the details about it. I think the most important thing here is an obstructed labor occurs when an irresistible force, uterine contractions, meets an immovable object like the maternal pelvis, which can lead to massive crush in injuries, either to soft tissue and often to the death of the fetus. In one sentence, gives you the whole story, what the problem is. Um, and remember, the baby's head is impacted for days so that you lose the blood supply to this tissue. It isn't like a tear that occurs between the vagina and the bladder or vagina and the rectum. It's devascularized and it's necrosis. So the hole develops weeks, months afterwards. The difficulty is surgical treatment is successful, but doesn't guarantee urinary continence. Um, it's also not simple to do. It's usually done in a stepwise process because these are large um, defects. They're not simple defects. This is a hospital in Nigeria that has a vesicle vaginal center. And in fact, a lot of the data, I went to a, a meeting in Washington, D.C., and they're talking about this person's experience with vesicle vaginal fistulas and all that kind of stuff, and had a picture, and I said, I think I know that hospital. And so they've done so many of them that they've had great series to actually publish with. And then I later met in Michigan the urologist that had done the major work on the papers that were published and from this hospital. But it's a very um, long process. The women live at the facility. They, they do their cooking outside. They do their laundry. They're there usually for months at a time, and they do stage uh, staging and the procedure in several, several categories. Other thing I've been involved with is cervical cancer. Um, you know what the problem is? The big deal is um, the number here of how many cervical cancer is diagnosed worldwide and what the um, death rate is. And it's the second most common cancer in women and fourth leading cause of death in women worldwide. 85% um, of cervical cancers occur in the developing world. What do we know about cervical cancer? It's one of the few virally related cancers um, that have been diagnosed. Does that mean there's a lot more HPV in the developing world? No, it just means that nobody gets screened. So there's, there's very little treatment. Um, you know about how to treat it. Um, overall mortality is 55% worldwide and 20% in Switzerland. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, mortality is 80% because they present when they're having uh, copious discharge and you put a speculum in and it's already off the cervix in the vaginal wall or sometimes you can just see it already down in the labia. So late presentation, there's no preventative care um, or no uh, screening for it. Um, and what I was involved in was teaching um, screening for cervical cancer with something called visual inspection after application of acetic acid vinegar, um, and then uh, teaching people how to look for precancerous changes, which could be just benign HPV changes or could be mild dysplasia, moderate dysplasia. And once looking at that to treat it, either with cryotherapy or I was in a place where they were doing 
cold coagulation, which is an oxymoron because it is this disc that is very hot and it fries the cervix. And the woman just looks at you and, you know, I, I have a daughter that if you drew blood, she would be screaming and lying apoplectic and you're, you're frying the cervix for 30 seconds and the woman is just looking at you. But it's an acceptable therapy just like freezing would be or LEAP. But um, no healthcare providers really do that. Taught a course on that in uh, Nigeria. Um, and was, you can tell the crowd was going wild. You can see all the enthusiasm about my teaching ability. Um, had a great course from John Hopkins, Chicago, And uh, they gave me all the, the uh, sl slides in that. Um, and it was great to teach them. And then we taught them their cryotherapy. Uh, the crowd did go wild with that because um, they had never seen it. Even the head of the OBGYN department at Josh University Teaching Hospital that has a thousand medical students, um, you'd never had seen that. So everybody liked seeing cryosurgery. Um, this is one of the nurses doing that. Um, oh, this is the cervical model. It's PVC pipe with a sausage. Here you can see the sausage. Sausage stuck in there, held there with nails, and then they got to do cryotherapy. Um, on the demo model. I thought it was only fair they learn on something other than the human being. So we did that. And then this is instituting it and doing it in the clinic. So here's the uh, um, challenges. Um, most assist countries have gender gaps. Significant challenge to improve the nutritional status of girls and women. Uh, healthcare women uh, central to the improvement is increased access to education greater value on women's health. We also have to deal with the fact that there's epidemiologic transition. You know, most um, healthcare, yes, thank you. I, I will quit soon. Uh, most healthcare is, uh, I feel like I'm in elementary school that, you know, that just went off. Um, healthcare has been um, directed toward infectious disease. But now as people are we're treating more infectious disease, pe people are living longer. Now we have what are the first world problems of more cardiovascular disease, cancer. And so most of the uh, developing countries have a double burden of disease from both infectious etiologies and non-infectious etiologies. I'll leave you with this. Um, women are not dying because of diseases we cannot treat. They're dying because societies have yet to make the decision that their lives are worth saving. I did have some resources. <coughs> so, um, I really appreciate your attention. And it's really a delight to be here. I'll just tell you that. Um, and I know you have clinical responsibilities. And I'd love to spend the whole day. But if you have a couple questions or if you can stay, um, I'm happy to address that. I know some of you have clinics and surgeries, maybe laboring patients, um, and we do have to be cognizant of women's health in the developed world as well as the developing world. But if there's any questions or comments, I'd be happy to address them. Why do you think Southeast Asia is been the successful with meeting the needs of women, and yet even other parts of Asia have been successful with women? resources, but it's the same. Well, a lot of it has to do, I think, uh, as we're moving forward, like Bangladesh, I would say, has moved forward to women's education and contraception. I, I was on a river cruise down the river in Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh, and I'm going under a, a, a bridge, and there's this big thing that says, green love. And I'm looking at that, and I go to the, what is green love? They're condoms. <laughs> and so, I don't know, they get to be green love, but they're condoms. So they're talking about contraception, and they are also uh, have done a lot of village workers. In other words, they put money not into big programs. You really have to get into the villages and the small areas and address some of the basic needs, which are contraception and education for girls and women, and economic development, even if it's having an impact on the environment a lot of cloth, uh, clothing manufacturing, dyeing of cloth has moved to Bangladesh, and women are employed um, to work in that. So now they have a job and they're economically looked upon with favor. They're getting education. 
And so their fertility rate has dropped down to 2.3 um, babies per or babies per woman, and it used to be seven. In Pakistan, with the same religious bias, they're both very um, Muslim countries, has not dropped the fertility rate. So they're still having six and seven kids. So they, it's part of it is to do with this education, but really the the health workers going to the village level, raising education and economic value of women has, has made a big difference in there. So when you look at a region, you have to look at what the individual programs are of the countries. I'm putting money, Nigeria is the wealthiest country in Africa. They spend $8 a year per person for health. I mean, and the, you know, if you look on the uh, health index, I think of 175 countries and 154. But they haven't put the money into, into any infrastructure. All the HIV drugs come from Europe and the United States. 90% of the drugs come by volunteer programs. So they're not putting any money into their own health care for, for women. So I think you have to look at individual programs, what they've done. But real key is putting people down at the village level and in getting some very simple um, things going for that. That's kind of what that traditional birth attendant was, was trying to get to a village level as well.